namaste. So it looks like this series on bhakti and liberation is going to expand. <laughs> it's going to expand into something quite substantial. <laughs> After the last video, uh, one of the viewers wrote a long comment. <laughs> and um, although there was really nothing wrong with what he said, it implied that jnana is the only doorway to liberation. And that's just not true. Bhakti is also a path to the same liberation. And this is supported in many, many scriptures, including even Bhagavad Gita. But the Neo-Advaitins have propagated the point of view that only jnana leads to liberation. But that's just not supported by the scriptures or the great teachers like Shankaracharya. Huh? I personally know at least four major paths to the same liberation. Bhakti, Jnana, the Qigong, Chinese Yoga, and then there's Tantra. I mean, actually, there are many paths. And they all go to the same place. Huh? They all reach the top of the mountain, but they do so from different directions. It depends on where you are. If you're north of the mountain, you have to travel south to reach the top. If you're south of the mountain, you have to travel north. So the directions appear contradictory. Oh, you're going south. Well, I'm going north. <laughs> but you reach the same place in the end. So I think I need to not only clarify, but explain in detail how bhakti also reaches to liberation. I think we have spent already several years <laughs> talking about jnana and the Buddha's teaching. Uh, so now let's give equal time to bhakti. <laughs> Besides, I'm practicing bhakti in the completion stage right now. So I'm going to include my insights uh, from my own practice. So, okay. The Advaitins, both the authentic Advaitins and the Neo-Advaitins, are correct when they say that practice of jnana liberates one, leads to moksha. But that liberation has to be complete. It has to be a total merging into non-duality. And the problem with the pretentious Advaitins and the Neo-Advaitins is that they still maintain a duality between duality and non-duality. The real liberated soul sees the self, with a capital S, in everything, even so-called duality. He doesn't make any distinction. Why? Because we know that duality is simply a mirage arisen in the real self, in Brahman the false self, with a small s, the ego, the mind, the body, the world, all that dualistic stuff, actually doesn't even exist. It's simply an appearance. Like if we're in the desert and we see a mirage of a lake in the distance, it's true. It's not really a lake. It's an illusion of a lake. But it is a real mirage. 
So just because there's a mirage of a lake in the distance in the desert, we don't say that the desert isn't real. Just because when you're out in the ocean and you see a mirage of land in the distance, it doesn't mean that the ocean isn't real. No, only the mirage is unreal. So when we see the appearance of the world in Brahman, that doesn't mean that Brahman is unreal. Only the mirage, only the appearance is unreal. What is the appearance made of? Nothing but Brahman. Just like the mirage in the desert is made of nothing but the desert. You get it? So in other words, by practice of bhakti, the same uh, reduction and ultimately elimination of the false ego of desire for material things and even of birth and death can be eliminated. It simply uncovers the reality beneath. Brahman is real. Huh? Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mitya, says Sankaracharya. But everybody forgets there's also a third line that this world is composed only of Brahman. So it may be an illusion, huh? but underneath it is the reality. So both bhakti and jnana simply erase the illusion, uncovering the reality which has been there all the time. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why when people attain enlightenment, they laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> because it's such a joke. Here we've been all worried about, oh, I'm in illusion, I'm in maya, I'm in samsara, I'm, I'm trapped in birth and death, and I have to do all this sadhana to get out of it. Well, no, you're already out of it. <laughs> You just have to realize your actual nature and stop projecting or identifying with this false self. That's enlightenment. And that enlightenment is realized through, well, many different means. The Buddha said there's 80,000 Dharma doors. And for example, in the Vigyan Bhairav Tantra, there's, uh, what is it, 110, 112 different methods given. But there's thousands of them. Like, get off it already. Now, of course, in these series on this channel, we have presented Shankaracharya's Chatur Darshanam, the four views. And here they are. We went over them last time. But this does not imply that the path always has to go from karma yoga to bhakti yoga to raja yoga and then to jnana yoga. I mean, in most cases it does. But as I mentioned last time, the reason people give up bhakti and take up raja yoga is that they're impatient. They're still egoistic. They still think they're the doer. They still think they have to do something to get liberated. But if you simply continue your bhakti sadhana, then God will liberate you. Goddess will liberate you. But you have to be patient. You have to let go the idea of being the doer, the knower, uh, the seer, and so on. Let go the idea of being an individual at all. Just forget about it. And this is what happens in bhakti. When you actually realize bhakti, the, the beauty 
of the god or goddess is so overwhelmingly attractive, you forget all about yourself. <laughs> it just, you know, doesn't matter. Have you ever been absorbed in some kind of work? It could be anything. Uh, doing yoga exercises, or Tai Chi, or running, or music is especially good for this. Um, while playing music, or while chanting mantras, I would often just completely forget about everything. I mean, this, this happened just a few minutes ago. I was walking up and down my driveway chanting my mantra, and I just, I was not. Only the mantra was. And the mantra, of course, is just a pointer to the form of the goddess. So in this series, we're going to go over the bhakti methods. Now, I, have, I do have to acknowledge the uh, jnanis, the Advaitins and Neo-Advaitins, for saying that bhakti doesn't lead to liberation because the bhakti they're talking about is not the authentic bhakti. It's karma yoga with a thin veneer of bhakti. Uh, we've talked about this before, how so-called bhakti based on rules and regulations, scriptural injunctions, hierarchical organizations, and the guru as a dictator Huh? does not uh, give liberation. It's true. It gives good karma. Yes. And that store of good karma is necessary to approach the real bhakti, the authentic bhakti. So it is a necessary stage. You know, it's not that when we see people being fundamentalist or uh, dogmatic or didactic that we uh, should disrespect them, that we should think less of them. No, they're at a necessary stage in their spiritual growth, and we should do everything to encourage them. Because by practicing it wholeheartedly with faith, they'll come to the realization, like Parashuram. Parashuram in the uh, Tripura Rahasya, uh, he comes to the realization that this, this bhakti sadhana is beautiful, but is there no end to it? <laughs> or is there no completion of religious obligations? Does it go on forever? Come on. And when he submitted this doubt to his guru, then his guru said, ah, so you're ready for the next level. See, most gurus don't do like this. Most gurus try to establish a codependent relationship that keeps you trapped in a certain level because they're only maybe a little bit higher than you are <laughs> and they don't really have access to the next level. But a real guru does. And a real guru will point you in the right direction. Ah, I remember one, one time uh, I was in the Washington, D.C. ISKCON temple, and the temple president at the time had been a prominent disciple of Maharshi uh, Mahesh Yogi, you know, the TM guy. In fact, for several years, three or four years, he was Maharshi's personal secretary. So he had daily close contact with Marshi. And he used to keep asking him, Marshi, what is the greatest tr truth? And you know, Marshi, he would say, oh, you're not ready yet. <laughs> you know, so this went on for years. And finally, one day he asked him again, what is the greatest truth? And Maharshi said, okay, 
You want to know that? Go become a disciple of Bhaktivedanta Swami, the great teacher of bhakti. You see? So what happens, bizarrely enough, is that the people who can't discriminate, or excuse me, who falsely discriminate between duality and non-duality, even though they're pretending to be on the, on the Ajatta platform, they are actually on the Dvaitavada platform because they're teaching non-duality as a dualistic cult. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Huh? The Neo-Adwaitans and the pretentious Adwaitans say that, oh, you guys practicing bhakti, you guys practicing karma yoga, oh, you're in maya, man, you don't get it, you know. And because of this, they fall down. They fall down from their pretentious non-duality to duality because they're presenting non-duality as a dualistic teaching. See, they're discriminating between duality and non-duality. If they were really on the Ajatta platform like Ramana Maharshi, they would not discriminate. They would see the self in everything. So that's going to be the theme of this series. And we're going to go into the, the most powerful bhakti methods. The Siddhi Mantra and the Mahashodashi Mantra. Om Tat Sat. Voodoo Saranaya.